be a bit more strict with the time. But uh, we still have um, still sort of a relaxed program. Uh, so our next speaker is one Juan Sierra um, from Spain, and he's going to be talking about graphene spintronics. And I will, using the powers of the, the chairman, assign another guy to actually handle the questions. And this time it's going to be, let's see, uh, maybe Gerson, who is a graphene person as well, can do it. I think it's good for you. <coughs> and be strict with the time. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm very pleased to be here. And I would like to start by saying thank you to the local organizers and also Yarla um, Fabian and Sergio Venezuela for inviting me to, to present the, um, this work. So this is a talk about uh, how spins behave in, uh, in graphene. And in particular, I, I, I will just uh, give you uh, two of the current research uh, that we are just uh, we are doing in, in, in Spain. So one is uh, related with uh, proximity-induced uh, spin orbit coupling and how spins propagate and influence by, by this uh, spin orbit coupling. And is in the second part of, of, of the talk, I would like to show you how uh, thermal gradients can, uh, can sustain and can enhance spin currents in, in lateral devices. So let me start by highlight some, some guys from the group of Sergio, especially these two guys, PhD student Antonio Benitez and the postdoc William Savero. They, are, they have done an excellent work in the proximity-induced uh, spin orbit coupling uh, research. And also these guys that are former members of the group, that they were, they were more involved on the, on the second part on, on, uh, on this spin heat interaction. So just in case that you have uh, been living in a rock or you have not attended the, 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 the talks this morning. So there is nothing to say that graphene is extraordinary material from many points of view. And as I've been just uh, mentioned this morning, so it's, it's a gate tunable uh, material. You can control the carrier density by external gating. He, it, it also has a very high electronic mobilities. And what is particularly relevant for, for the spintronic community is that it fulfills all the requirements to, ha to, to, to get a suitable uh, spintronic device. So th this morning was uh, explained very well by, uh, by Roland that it's possible to inject spins and detect spins in, in graphene. And this was done in this seminal work in uh, Groningen, in the Bombay's group. And also, due to this low spin orbit coupling and the lack, the lack of hyperfine interaction, it was predicted that you can have a spin lifetimes extremely, it's extremely huge in the range of microseconds to millisecond range. And so there is one point here important. So in this seminal paper, it's, it's very nice if you go to this. It, this, this paper is, 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 is beautiful from many point of view, but if you look to the, to the values that they, they measure of the spin lifetimes are on the, on the order of hundreds of picoseconds. So this is not a really a good results if you compare with metals, but was a really a breakthrough because it was the first, for the first time when they was really experimentally demonstrated that you can inject these spins in, in graphene. And also Roland explained, he, so he, he, he did a very nice job because it, it took like one third of my talk. So, <laughs> so it's, this is especially relevant and this is why Graphene is, is, is very important for, for spin tronics because you can manipulate the spins. So this is not possible in any other system nowadays. Okay? And the way to, to, to manipulate and to control these spins when they go through the, through the spin channel is via these proximity-induced effects. Okay? So, so this, the two-dimensional character of these systems makes that if you assemble different uh, crystals, you can control just by you can combine several things. One is that you, 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 can, you can have pristine graphene quality, but you can also manipulate and control the spin, the ballet, and the orbital uh, degeneracy. So this was explained by Roland this morning, but just very briefly. So transition metal digalgalgonites are of, of, of special relevance because they are highly spin orbit coupling materials. 
And when they proximitize with, with graphene, they can imprint this spin orbit coupling and this spin ballet, uh, this spin ballet um, effect in, in, in the graphene. So basically, when you proximitize this, this, this transition, metal, transition metal like galganites with graphene, you see that there is this splitting of the bands, the opening, uh, the opening of the gap in a millielectron uh, millielectron volts range, and what is especially relevant is this spin texture. Okay, so you have this spin splitting, and you have this out of plane uh, spin texture, and you have also a winding uh, in uh, in plane component. So in principle, if you if you just now send here by this channel spins, they should behave. So if you imprint this uh, spin texture, I don't know if you see the tip. Is you see the tip? But so if you imprint this uh, spin texture, spins should behave differently if they propagate in plane or out of plane. So this is what. Uh, we implement in the group, so I will uh, skip all the all the process how you can inject the spins and how they propagate because this was introduced by Roland. But just let's imagine that you have a spins that propagates here in the in the spin channel. So we we just focus on the spin lifetime and isotropy experiments. So that basically this is how the spins behave. So what is the difference between the spin lifetimes when the spins are propagating and, and, and processed in the plane, and when they process out of plane. And there are basically two different techniques to, to, to determine this, this, this parameter. One is, as uh, Roland explained this morning, uh, uh, the brick spin precession. And also, another one is just I apply in the magnetic field along uh, the graphene channel. Because in this case, you are sensitive to both uh, spin lifetime. So just to give you a little bit more information, why we represent this in a, cosin in a cosinus square uh, in this scale is, so basically what we, what we did is, is we solved the, 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 the block spin diffusion equation. And <coughs> you have basically uh, two components, one that is, um, yeah, because it's, yeah. So what we did is um, we analyzed this uh, the signal when it's uh, fully uh, when it's saturated. So this saturation means that the spins that are perpendicular to the magnetic field are fully the phase, and then this remanent signal comes from the projection of of the spins along the magnetic field uh, direction. So then why cos uh, this square is because you have to project the magnetization along the magnetic field, and then you have to back again to the, to the, to the spin detector. So that's why you have this cosinus square. And as, as Roland explained, so in the case of the isotropic uh, spin, uh, isotropic uh, relaxation, you should observe a straight line while depending if you have an isotropy uh, larger or smaller than, wa than one, you should have lines that lies above this straight line or uh, below. So how we, how we did this exp experiment, so this is, a, this, is a typical, this is an optical image of a typical device that we fabricated. And what is here uh, particularly relevant is, so we, we fabricated in the same uh, flake two devices. So one is a pristine graphene channel that we use as a control experiment. And in the other one, we just uh, attach uh, a, tra a transition metal dichloride. In this case, it's tungsten uh, disulfide. We did similar experiments for mol uh, molybdenum disulfide. And we implement this technique, oblique spin precession, but we also implement uh, this uh, highly plane precession. So basically, the, the point is, this is the, the, the scheme of, of, of this. Uh, so basically, it's to study with these techniques how is the signal that you just pick up in this detector. So in the control experiment, 
So we applied first the magnetic field out of plane, so we, uh, we have access to the spin, uh, to the in-plane spin relaxation, and we also apply the magnetic field along the, along the uh, spin channel. And what you see here is that in both cases, you have a similar spin signal. So meaning that you have an isotropic, a suspected isotropic behavior. But, sorry, this? Yeah, this is a good point. So when you apply the magnetic field out of plane, so basically for the magnetic fields that we apply, all the magnetization on the electrodes lays in plane. But when you apply the magnetic field in plane but in this direction, the shape and isotropy is different, so you have a little bit of tilting on the magnetization. And this is just, that's why you have this uh, discrepancy. So in the case of, of, of the, of the bilayer uh, the structure, so blazingly what we saw is that when the spins are processing in plane, you have a much more reduced spin signal. And in the case of, of uh, in-plane magnetic field, what we observe is that so for zero magnetic field, you have a very small signal, but as soon as the, si the, the spins start to process out of plane, they have the magnitude just reach a maximum. So this maximum correspond when the spins are perpendicular in the position of the transition metal decal covenant. And they guys pass through this, uh, through this bilayer structure easily. So this was qualitatively an indication that you have anisotropic uh, spin dynamics. So and what we did is we also we, we implement this uh, oblique spin precession, and here is the is exactly the graph that uh, Roland uh, presented this morning. <laughs> so this is the case of the control sample that you have a straight li a, str a straight line, and we observe this huge anisotropic behavior in the case of the bilayer heterostructure. So how you can explain this, um, well, is, is relatively simple. So this is very well explained and is discussed by this paper in, uh, in, uh, in the group of, of uh, Stefan Roche. So this is very well explained if you have inter scattering. So the mechanism how a spin relax in this, in this bilayer heterostructure is through interlayer uh, 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 inter scattering. And this is very well, uh, so you see that in the case of this inter scattering, you can have anisotropies as large as 100, while if you have just intra scattering, what you have is just, you recover one and a half, that is the Rashba uh, type. So this is something new, so I will just uh, explain this more carefully. So another, uh, very interesting uh, and beautiful experiments that you can uh, perform in these systems is spin charge conversion experiments. So in this case, due to the unique properties of this uh, spin orbit coupling that you can imprint in graphene, you can also generate uh, spin hole effects and uh, spin galvanic effect. So this is a scheme of, of the devices that we fabricated. In this case, we have a whole, a whole cross and we put here on top a transition metal like a carbonate. And suppose that you have this electric field here in this arm. So due to this spin orbit coupling, you have two effects. So on wha one is this current create this spin accumulation and a spin, uh, and a spin current due to the spin hole effect. But you have also this in-plane uh, spin density that is created in this interface. So now, depending how you play with the magnetic field that you apply to the, your system, you can be sensitive to either the spins coming from the spin hole effect or the spins coming from the inverse spin galvanic effect. So if you apply the magnetic field along the, the, the graphene channel, so spins coming from the, gal from the spin galvanic effect, they don't feel this, uh, th they don't feel this uh, uh, magnetic field, so they don't precess, while these spins will experience precession. 
and just opposite, so in the case that you apply the magnetic field out of plane, the spins that comes from the spin hole effect are insensitive to this uh, magnetic field, while this spin density coming from the spin galvanic effect, they will experience precession. So there have been some observations of this, uh, of this spin hole effect in this uh, bilayer heterostructure in different groups. But most of these experiments has a, has a, a shortcoming. And is the problem is that you cannot really fully uh, discriminate if this spin hole effect or the spin galvanic effect is coming from the graphene or is coming from the transition metal, transition metal like I covenant. Right? You have to control very well in this is on these experiments if your the, the conductive the conducting character of your of your uh, TMD. So this is this is what we did. So indeed we characterize first this interface between the TMD and the graphene. So we, we, we apply the voltage bias through this interface and we measure the current. So these are the characteristic the characteristics IV curves. So you see that we have a threshold voltage of around uh, 12 volts. So meaning that here the transition metal decalcogenate is insulated. And here, what I show here is how is the, the gate voltage of the graphene that is underneath this uh, bilayer. And is so this is, is important that, so we have the here a charge neutrality point because in this way, we are able to measure when the transition metal like alkylonate is insulating, how is this spin hole effect and this spin galvanic effect for the hold and electron conduction. So again, this is, yeah. So can I go back one slide? I just want to understand the gate. So the gate is underneath, so that's changing the Dirac point? What, what is it, yeah? So the gate, when I talk about gate, is what Roland explained this morning. So we have, so these devices are done in a silicon dioxide uh, substrate, so you can apply it, uh, an external back gate. Mm -hmm. So you, you just create an electro electrostatic gating. So this is this. And what, what we did is we also apply a bias voltage from here to one of these electrodes just to characterize this. So this is, uh, I don't know if it's, it's clear. So VG is which? So this is VG is the gate voltage, mm -hmm. the external, the, the, the back gate. Yeah. Okay. So this is, you see here, this is the, so basically this is the charge neutrality point. So this is hole conduction and this is electron conduction right. in our graphing. Okay. So this is, again, an optical image of, of the device. Again, we, 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 we fabricate the devices with a control sample, and also the channel that is uh, partially covered with this uh, transition metal decalcogenate. So in the case of, of, uh <coughs> of, this of the inverse spin hole effect, so what we did is, so you inject the spins in this front magnet, so the spins will propagate along the channel, and then we apply the magnetic field in plane. So we were, in this case, for this geometry, we are sensitive only to uh, to the spins that comes from the spin hole effect. So, and this is the this is the uh, this is the, the curve that we measure. So you see that we have this uh, this is this oscillatory behavior. So this maximum corresponds when the when the the, the spins process just pi over two. So it's 90 degrees here, and you pick the maximum signal, and this is decreasing is just due to the phasing of the spins. So now you, you change the orientation of the external magnetic field by applying out of plane, we should be sensitive to these sp uh, spins coming from the spin galvanic effect. And this is what we observe here. So we also observe this oscillatory behavior of the spins when, when you apply this in, the, in, this, in this geometry. 
So you can also do this uh, studies as a function of the external uh, of the backgate, just as a function of the carrier density. And what we observe is that in the case of the spin galvanic effect, we have this uh, asymmetric behavior. This we have a uh, this uh, change of sign. That this is just uh, due to the to the nature of the of, of the carrier. So in this case is uh, electrons or holes. And in this is we have also we measure this. Uh, uh, in very spin hole effect, and we saw that it's peaking nearby the, the charge neutrality point. So it was also particularly uh, interesting that, so we did these measurements as a function for different temperatures, and so here you see <coughs> how the experiments match very nicely with, with the, with the, the, uh, the theoretical uh, calculations of the spin hole uh, Conductivity. This 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 uh, calculations were done also in the group of uh, Stefan Roche. So and you see that you can also we can also even reproduce this asymmetry in the peak and this uh, this broadening. Yes. This is sim is this a coherent effect? Are you adding two amplitudes? Is this some kind of interference effect or not? That has nothing to do with the physics of you know other system where you have asymmetric profiles. So no, like so this asymmetry. No. So this asymmetry just comes from the. So you introduce in the Hamiltonian different mm -hmm. different uh, the Zeeman uh, uh, term. You have also the K-Mele term and blah blah blah. So you have different terms, and they include these asymmetries between electrons and holes. Could be the sum of two con the two amplitudes squared, as opposed to the sum of two things that have. Uh, so, but you're saying it's just like resistors in series or something like that. Well, this is in, in a way. So, I don't know all the details about the theory. <laughs> okay, but uh, and this I mean maybe Stefan will explain you better. But so the idea here is that. So the the experiment and the, the model pick all the features of the of the experiment. It picks everything. So as soon as you start to decrease the temperature, you see that this asymmetry is increasing, and this broadening is also uh, more sharp. And this is what we observe in the experiment. So. Is this a pure uh, intrinsic uh, spin hole effect, or uh, is due to but this is skew scattering? Or I think it's pure intrinsic spin hole effect. So it, uh, can it be that it's, uh, the simple explanation there is that your Berry curvature for electrons and holes is just uh, uh, pointing in opposite directions? Mm, yes, it can be, yes. I have the I have the time that I need to explain you something new. This is something new. This is <laughs> so. The idea here on this experiment was to 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 see what is the spin heat interactions on, on on lateral devices. So, and what we observe is that you can control more than control. You can enhance and you can sustain spin currents by uh, using. Uh, thermal gradients in your in your devices. So before showing you the, the main results, I have to go to to explain a bit how you can create on these lateral devices this uh, temperature difference and what you expect to measure. Okay? So <coughs> conventional uh, thermoelectric measurements in, in graphene were done just in, in seminal works of in, in harbor and uh, in the group of Philip Kim and uh, in the group of On, and they basically consist on injecting a current through a microfabricated heater that creates a temperature gradient in the substrate. And basically what they measure was simultaneously the voltage, the thermoelectric voltage that you build here, and also the temperature of on, on these on the on these uh, contacts. 
And what they measure is that the thermoelectric power change sign nearby the charge at point, depending if you have whole conduction or electron conduction. Kay? So this is again, they measure this thermoelectric uh, voltage the, um, as a function of the carrier density by applying this uh, external gate. So of course, if you just uh, look to how is this thermoelectric uh, voltage as a function of the current, what you have is this parabolic dependence because you have, it's a pure Joule dissipation uh, uh, behavior. So several years uh, ago, what we introduced a different on this scheme, and in this case, we use this internal heater. So now in this case, graphene is part of the heater. And what we observe is that when we inject here, when, when we bias with current here, we observe a completely different behavior of this thermoelectric voltage. So we, we, we observe that this parabolic uh, dependence morph to a, this sort of V uh, shape, okay? And indeed, this was, this was um, an evidence of uh, hot current generation in, in graphene. So basically what's happening here is that when you drive this current, you put the energy and you heat your crystal lattice, but you also heat your carrier, uh, your carriers in the system. And now is when time scales take place. So electron-electron interaction is extremely fast. It's hundreds of femtoseconds here in this system, okay? But the electron, fo the electron phonon uh, coupling is weak and slow. Mostly in the range that we, we do the experiments, in all this range, you have this condition. Okay? So you have very weak electron phonon coupling. So basically, when you drive this current, you are thermally decoupling the electron system to the crystal lattice. So now these hot carriers that we generate, they start to diffuse away, and they are picked up here in this... Uh, in this electrode, okay? So now, our question was, okay, so if we consider what are the lifetimes and the lengths of the spins in the, yes. So this is the regime where you're actually setting up some chemical potential at a higher temperature for the electro electronic system? Yeah. That's connected to my previous question. So the electronic system is at a high temperature and just moving down diffusively without seeing the lattice. So that's yeah. the regime. You, yes. At the end, they relax, but very slowly. And in the particular case of graphene, is not, what we also show in this, uh, in this experiment was that it's not a direct coupling with, uh, with uh, phonons, but it's like uh, an indirect. It's through super collisions that is like, a, it's like um, you just go through impurities and they, 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 they generate phonons. So it's not a direct process. Does this depend on, on whether you have electrons and holes? No. So it's symmetric yeah. up to the densities where you still have a, like a Dirac cone physics. Okay. Sorry, the heating is from ohmic dissipation in the contact resistance or, or where exactly is the heating taking place? So the heating, so we, 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 we send the current through these two electrodes. So the heating is 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 during here. On the yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As I remember, in the in the one of the morning talks, they at some point there was some saturation that that would means you looking at um, band structure effects. So you're never away from this Dirac cone. Can you experiment? Or you don't want to? Experimentally, no. I mean, yeah, <laughs> no. So, from the experimental point of view, there are so many issues. So you are very constrained. To, uh, you cannot apply too high bo uh, external gates. Y you have also to control the current that you send. So it's, it's tricky. Okay, so now plays here the role of, of, of the of the lifetimes. So if you consider what is the, we explained this morning, Roland, what is the order of, 
the order of magnitude of the of the speed lifetime in graphene. So you have something like around 10 nanoseconds between 0.1 and 10 nanoseconds. And the lifetimes of these carriers that we are generating through this uh, configuration is on this order, okay? And you have also these characteristics, uh, relaxation and all that. So there is an overlapping between these two lifetimes. So our question was, okay, it should be a, an influence of these hot carriers on a spin. So in order to see this, what we fabricate is this sort of hybrid devices where we combine metal electrodes that we use to create these hot carriers, but we also use these uh, spin-sensitive uh, electrodes, okay? This is a sketch of the device that we use. So basically, we simultaneously apply this DC current here that creates hot carriers that propagate along graphene, and also we are simultaneously injecting the heat spin. So now the question is, okay, what's happened with the spins that we detect on this detector? So here I show you what we measure when we apply the magnetic field along the, uh, when we apply the magnetic field along the easy axis of these uh, ferromagnets, and what we observe is that this spin signal change. And we did the same with the Hall spin precession. In this case, we applied the magnetic field out of plane, and we observe that there is an increase of this spin signal uh, when we turn on the, the DC current. So if you do this as a function of the, of the carrier density, what we observe is that we have an enhancement close to the charge neutrality point. And the question now is how we can explain this experiment. And now this, this is the most important <laughs> slides of my talk. So let's revisit the idea of a thermocouple. Okay, so suppose that you have a thermocouple that is formed by two strips of graphene with different current concentration. So one is electron and the other is hole. Remember that you change the CV coefficient change depending if you have hot, um, electrons or hole. So if you just build here this uh, temperature different, the thermoelectric voltage that you were going to measure is proportional to the difference of the Seebeck coefficients times this uh, temperature gradient. So if we look now to the spin case, and whenever all the, all the distances involved in the experiments are within the spin, uh, the spin relaxation length, you can also think that, okay, I will have different Seebeck coefficients if, we have, if I have spin up or spin, if I am injecting spins with one polarization or another polarization, so I will have different spin, uh, Seebeck coefficients for spin up and spin down. And on top of the spin signal that you should measure, you have this additional term that is purely due to this temperature gradient. And this is what is plot here. So these are, these dots correspond to the, is, is a completely a spin measurement, so we measure how is the spin signal in a, in a, in a, in a, in a spin signal when we turn on the, the current on the heater, and this is a pure thermoelectric uh, voltage, uh, pure thermoelectric measurement, and it's remarkable this how these two independent measurements uh, scale well. And this is because I am running out of time. This is my last, I last leave this. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you for the talk. And uh, one more question, maybe. Um, I, I have one, actually. In, in your uh, figure showing the internal and external heater, the difference between the V and the parabolic signal